Robots that teach. Hello, this is Ron Powell, and you're listening to Fast Forward on the World Transformed. This program presents conversations with thought leaders who are shaping our future through new ideas and new technologies. In this edition of Fast Forward, our guest, Mitch Rosenberg, tells us how the Kibo robot is revolutionizing how kids learn. In an increasingly data-driven world, do we need new approaches to encourage technical literacy at a young age? How about the need for kids to interact with real objects in the real world and to develop both their creative and quantitative skills? Let's explore. The future begins right now. Live to see it, friends, and welcome to the world transformed. This program is your guide to an astounding future that lies ahead, a future that will be here sooner than you think. I'm Phil Bowermaster, and I'm pleased to introduce our very special guest for today's program, Mitch Rosenberg. Mitch is the CEO of Kinder Labs Robotics. He brings more than 30 years of experience in the technology industry in engineering, marketing, product management, and sales. He has executive experience at several successful technology firms, including robotics firms such as Automatics Inc., Kiva Systems, which was sold to Amazon back in 2012, and Rethink Robotics. Mitch, welcome to Fast Forward on the World Transformed. Well, Phil, it's a pleasure to be your guest today, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. Absolutely. Well, it's great to have you with us. This has been one we've been looking forward to for some time. So, Mitch, uh, let's start with a very quick definition of what we'll be talking about today. What exactly is Kibo? Well, Ron, that depends on who you are. To a teacher or a parent, Kibo is an experiential STEAM learning platform that exercises kids' creativity in, in building, in programming, as well as arts and crafts. But to a kid, Kibo is a robot. Now, what's unique about Kibo is it's designed for children so young that they haven't heard yet that STEM is hard to do. But it's perfect for them because it doesn't have any screens or keyboards, and it makes abstract concepts tangible so that they can understand them at their developmental stage. What's well, always is kids are really have this fascination, and at a young age, it's amazing what they can do. Well, you're absolutely right. And it's also important to know what they can't do. Kids at a really early age aren't very good at really understanding abstract things. And so for them to really learn something, they have to get their hands on it and they have to be physically moving. So let's uh, take a few minutes and we'll kind of back up and talk about how Kibo came to be. I, I noticed, Mitch, when you introduced the concept to us, you, you said it's a STEAM learning solution, which we'll get into what that means a, a little bit down the road. It's probably not what people are picturing when they, when they hear that something is, uh, in, involves STEAM. But, but let's, let's build to that. Tell us about your experience in robotics leading up to Kibo. How did you, how did you come to be here? Well, I, I didn't start out in robotics. I did start out as an engineer. Um, after college, I was a research engineer for a large firm working on infrared imaging, that is machines that can see in the dark. Right. And after going to engineering grad school, I was a design engineer, and that was with the first robotics firm I worked with. That was a company you mentioned called Automatics that made novel vision systems, machine vision systems, and a robot arm controller for manufacturing applications. Um, later, I worked at uh, the firm that made dial-up video conferencing a mainstream technology. But after working at several of these very innovative technology firms, I slowly realized that when a high-tech firm is less successful than it intends, it's more likely because of a misstep in marketing or sales or strategy and not a failure of their core technology. Mm. For example, I joined um, Kiva Systems because it's found, their founder, Mick Mounts, had figured out a market and a, and a problem to solve first and then chose the appropriate technology suite to solve that problem rather than what many companies do, which is the reverse. They start with a technology they love and they know and look for something that can be solved with it. 
And, uh, and that was one reason why that company was so successful. And what was the problem that they were working on solving? Well, Mick had worked at uh, several companies that were trying to uh, have the business model where you could deliver things to people in their homes. And what it came down to, believe it or not, was how efficiently, how economically uh, those items could be stored in a warehouse and then retrieved to satisfy a customer order. Mm. What he found was that both manual systems and the current generation of automated systems for operating in a warehouse were simply not up to the diversity of items and the speed of, of orders and the uniqueness of orders in the internet um, web store driven age. And he developed a mobile robot system that could radically speed up and increase the accuracy of, of the order fulfillment as well as making the experience of the human workers in the warehouse a lot safer and a lot more fun and pleasant. And I would just add to our listeners, if you've never seen that, if you've never seen what this system is all about, you should Google it because it's really wild. I mean, it's really quite amazing what they're able to, what they're able to automate. And a, a company like Amazon, you can see where uh, that kind of solution would have been exactly the sort of thing they were looking for. So much as you're making things happen in the robotics industry, your co-founder, Marita Bears, was doing some important research that led to the founding of Kinderlab Robotics. Can you tell us about that research? Sure. Um, um, Marina Bears is a professor of early childhood education at Tufts University in the Boston area. And her research for the past 15 or almost 20 years now has been into how young children acquire STEM thinking skills. Um, uh, she's already written four books and, and has a TED Talk on the subject. She's considered pretty much one of the world experts on how young children really learn STEM thinking. Um, some of the results of her, her research has been how important it is that children have a positive experience of themselves thinking about science or math or some kind of building before they're about eight years old. Um, it's also important to know that, um, that kids need to have something tangible. As I said, it can't be an abstract concept or even a screen-based concept because kids at that age interpret things they see on screens as, a, as an abstraction rather than a, an, a reality, and their brains are not really developed yet enough to understand the relationship between what they see on a screen and what's true in the real world. And then finally, she's discovered that in order for kids to really learn STEM, they can't read it in a book or hear it from a teacher. They need to have experiential, um, um, experiential experiences. Boy, that's a little bit redundant. They need to have experiences with STEM that are open-ended and creative. They need to do the building. They need to do the programming or the decorating or the, the discovery of what the problem is and how to solve it. They need to do it themselves, and they need to put their hands on it in order for it to be something that they can take away and, and actually acquire as learning rather than have it be a momentary entertainment that they forget about two weeks from now. You know, Mitch, the last time you and I spoke, we talked about, I was telling about my experience with the programming language logo, which is a kind of a similar idea. It's a, a way to get kids interested in computer programming. It's a, it's a way to get them interested in technology. But Based on what you're saying, the drawback to something like, say, e even something designed for kids like Logo would be that it's still living in that world of abstraction, right? It's still a computer screen rather than uh, something happening in the physical space that we occupy, that, uh, w which is where learning really Wait, takes place. You know, you raise a great point, and, and um, Logo was invented by uh, Professor Baer's uh, thesis advisor at MIT uh, when she was getting her doctorate, Seymour Papert. Um, and he invented also a, a physical device called the turtle that you'd program with Logo to do things in the physical world. And he had a lot of profound ideas about how kids would learn science, technology, engineering, and math. The problem, there is no real problem with Logo. Um, what, what Kibo does that's different is that Logo is a perfect language for kids that are starting to be able to understand abstraction and actually write programs on screens. But uh, Professor Baer's innovation is how to take some of the core ideas in Logo, in the 
turtle and from, from Professor Pappert and, and adapt it so it's ideal for the cognitive development stage that young children find themselves at. She, di she discovered that it was really critical to do this because if you simply wait until kids are older before teaching them STEM, then many kids will have already formed a self-image that does not include STEM competency as, a, as, as part of it. Um, they'll say, oh, you know, they're old enough at age eight, nine to say, you know, I can't learn STEM because nobody I know who's like me works in STEM. Or they'll say, I, I can't learn STEM because, um, because, uh, because I'm a girl and girls don't do STEM. Uh, society, unfortunately, gives this message inadvertently in some cases to girls. So it's really critical that kids at a really early age, before they've taken on um, predetermined notions of, of who's good at math or who's good at engineering, that they have a positive experience of their own. So when they encounter these messages out in the world, they have an internal memory and experience that's so positive that it countervails that societal message. Right. Okay. So great. So we got these we, two threads going here. We've got Marina doing this research. We've got you out working in kind of the business side of the robotics world. And what happened? How did these two threads come together? How did you two decide to start a, start a company together? Well, I, I wish I could tell you it was um, pure brilliance on either or both of our parts, but it really wasn't. It was serendipity. Um, I, Marina and I have something in common. We, we both have sons who are the same age. And although we didn't know each other before, uh, at one point, uh, our kids were at a birthday party um, of one of their classmates, and it was far away from both of our houses. So you know how it is with parents in these birthday parties. If it's far away from your house, you can't go home. After right. you dropped your kid off, you have to hang out till the party's over. And so I was hanging out, having coffee, and she said, oh, you're Mitch Rosenberg. You're the technology business guy. I want to ask you some questions. And I said, sure, I'm always happy to talk about the business of technology. And, and we went for a rock or walk around the block that ended up being a couple miles long because she had been doing this research around the world with prototypes that um, grad students had developed at Tufts that eventually became the Kibo robot, but were basically prototypes now. And everywhere she went, teachers that she was doing studies with, at the end of the study, they'd say, okay, I really would like to buy that robot. And Marina would have to say, you can't buy it anywhere. We just made it for the purposes of this research. And it happened for several years in a row. And eventually she said, you know, maybe this has to be a business because there's clearly a need for it. And her problem was she herself didn't have experiences in business and wasn't really comfortable necessarily with the idea. She's a pretty strong and committed academic. Right. And um, so she said, Mitch, what would it take to, um, to make this into a business? And, um, I said, well, you know, a business like this is going to be a couple of years before you make money. Um, this is what it's going to take. And she said, well, I think we should do it. And I said, I, you know, I, I really don't want to go for a couple of years without a salary at this point in my life. <laughs> she said, well, she said, I have something, I know something about, um, about how we can start this business that you don't. And she had years and years of experience getting grants. And there are a whole class of grants called SBIR grants from the National Science Foundation that require that you be a business to get the grant. Uh -huh. And so she basically, um, we basically correct, collaborated on a business plan, used that business plan to apply for grants, and got a series of three grants from the National Science Foundation that effectively launched the company. So it's almost like divine destiny that the two of you came together at a birthday party. I mean, kind of, it's one of those amazing uh, things that you go, wow, how did that happen? Yeah, because neither of us really had that in a, as a plan. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's, um, yeah I, in, in retrospect, I agree with you. It looks like destiny. But at the time, it just seemed like the least likely thing in the world. Sure, sure. So when did Kinder Lab Robotics uh, launch, and uh, what kind of results are you seeing so far? Well, the, the company was launched in um, May 2013, and we started shipping product about a year later. In time for the holidays and uh, we've had pretty steady and strong growth ever since um, at this point in time as we sit here today 
Uh, we've sold Kibos in all 50 U.S. states and several territories, as well as 54 countries around the world. And I'd say about two-thirds of the Kibo robots are um, doing their, their um, tireless work at schools and after-school programs, maybe camps, uh, libraries and museums, educational institutions. So two-thirds are in the education space, and about one-third are in homes uh, bought by parents and grandparents who see how excited their kids are about STEM ideas, STEAM ideas, really, and want to foster that in their children. So why don't we talk just a little bit more about what Kibo is then. I think we, we've, we've got to get into this just a bit. What is it exactly and what do, how do kids use it? What can they make or do with it exactly? Well, as I said earlier, if you're a kid, you know what it is. It's a robot. And right. kids know exactly what a robot is. Um, what makes this robot different from others out there, and there's a, certainly a marketplace full of robot kits out there today, is uh, a couple things. First of all, this robot is programmed using wooden blocks with pictures on them. So kids everywhere in the world know what to do with wooden blocks. You know, we have wooden blocks that have pegs on one side and holes on the other, a picture of, of a representation of what the robot would be doing, and kids just peg these blocks together, and voila, they have a program. And Kibo has a scanner inside built right into it, uh, essentially the same technology as a barcode scanner you'd find at a grocery checkout. And kids basically scan the blocks one at a time and push the one and only button on the, on the robot body, and it, it does what they programmed it to do. And for a kid, especially a young kid, who has control of almost nothing in this world, you can almost see the light go on when they realize that they can actually have control over this entity, over this robot. Right. So the first thing is that it's programmed with physical objects representing the very abstract idea that many people don't really understand called code. That's right. innovation number one. Innovation number two is you don't just code it. You also build your Kibo. So you put it together with, with motors and, and um, sensors and wheels and other stuff. Um, nothing is, no, there's no exposed uh, metal or anything like that. You plug it together pretty easily. A four-year-old can easily do it in a minute. But having a sense that they built it and programmed it themselves is what gives them the confidence. And then the third element of Kibo to keep in mind is that um, unlike many robots you see in movies or in stories, our Kibo robot doesn't already have a personality. It's not molded to be some other entity. It's basically a blank slate that you can build art on. The idea of decorating a robot to have a different purpose every time you play with it is designed into the robot from day one. And the idea here is multifold. First, we don't want the kid to feel like the robot is only a single purpose. If today you read a story like The Very Hungry Caterpillar and the kid's excited about that story, that kid can, can use uh, paper and, and, and tape and and um, pipe cleaners to turn their robot into a caterpillar and program it to do the things in the story. If the next day they see a movie and they're really excited by a spaceship, they can decorate their Kibo to look like a spaceship. And perhaps you can put um, circles of paper on the floor and have them program their robot to go from one planet to the other. Hmm. So the idea of, of open-ended creativity is designed in from the beginning. And that's important to get kids excited about what STEAM thinking can do. But it has another important purpose, and that is that in a classroom setting, where there are some kids who are naturals at science or math or building, and other kids who might not be, it gives the kids who are perhaps art-oriented or literature-oriented a chance to participate with critical roles in building the Kibo and programming it by essentially designing the art that's going to decorate it and make it into the entity that's going to fulfill the task that, the, that they have as a vision for their robot. So there are several things about Kibo that make it pretty unique out there and make it particularly exciting for kids and for educators and parents. Well, yeah, I could bring in a lot of different kinds of threads together there. I, I, think that's, I think that's really interesting. You know, when you, when you talk about taking it back just to those wooden blocks for a moment, that's fascinating. And for, for the real 
coder nerds listening in, I think people are going to want to know, is, is it roughly each block represents, say, a line of code or a subroutine or, you know, one task, a word? What's the breakdown there? Well, I'll give you examples. It's the best way rather than an abstract characterization. Um, we have uh, our blue blocks, our motion blocks, like forward, which will take the robot ahead about six inches or backward or turn right or turn left. We have blocks that um, light up a light bulb on the robot, and we'll have a little picture of a light bulb and the color of the light that'll come up. And we actually have some conditional blocks. They say things like repeat until, and they give the child a chance to say, repeat doing what? Repeat going forward. Until what? Until you detect a wall in front of you. And um, so the blocks can actually be somewhat sophisticated, but the kids don't feel like it's hard to learn. Right. So that's the, that's the nature of what these, these blocks can do. Now, I don't want to say that they're, that they're subroutines per se, because we are actually working on a way to represent subroutines in blocks so that young kids can understand what a subroutine is. And that will radically increase the amount of flexibility and creativity that they can use to design programs. And the challenge is to do it in a way that they can really understand. And, th and that raises another question, which is, are there variations on this? Are there, are there different versions, different block sets, or different robots for kids depending on age? Do you have a, a, a path for kids using this, going from a simpler use to a more complex use? Um, well, uh, the simple answer is no. It's the same robot body and the same block architecture, if you will. Um, we do offer four different kits, and they mostly differ in how many of the different sensor components, motor components, art components, and, and programming blocks that you have. But I wouldn't say that the least expensive one is exclusively and only for young ki younger kids, like four-year-olds, and the most expensive ones are exclusively for seven or eight-year-olds. I mean, it could break down that way, but it's, it's really about, about how much richness of curriculum, how much richness of play you can do with each kit. Um, now, we do have a curriculum that, that uh, for, for schools that are really trying to be a little bit more formal about how to introduce this, that, that does introduce concepts in a, in a stepwise manner, and, um, uh, but it's not necessary, and it's not, it doesn't break down by kit. It's more about how you use the kit that makes it more appropriate for the four-year-old or more appropriate for the seven-year-old. Right. Well, this is really amazing. I, I'm jealous of all these kids. Uh, I mean, I can totally understand why you have such a massive foot, footprint in uh, education right now. Uh, what is a typical Kibo deployment in a school? How many robots? How many kids? Well, I, I, that's a great question. So um, there's a, I'm, I'm going to say there's a half a dozen different ways I've seen it done, but I'd say my favorite picture looks like this the teacher decides they're going to do a unit on, on Steam, and it's going to be based on the Kibo platform. And um, the really experienced teacher or the thoughtful teacher will coordinate it with something else. Maybe they'll coordinate it with um, a cultural studies program they're doing on different countries in Latin America. And the, um, there'll be about, I'm going to say two, three, maybe as, as many as four, but not more than four kids um, in a group that works with a single robot kit. So by having multiple kids, there's a kind of meta-learning that takes place that I'm particularly um, partial to because it mirrors the way the real world works, whether you're working in technology or in the arts or you know, in, in the media, any, any business is generally co a collaboration. And so we've designed the Kibo to be really amenable to a collaborative work environment. And so you see these groups of two to four kids in a circle for maybe 20 or 30 minutes doing some piece of the problem. So the teacher will say something like, you know, we studied these, um, these seven countries in Latin America. Um, each group will get a, uh, let's say, a two-minute video of, of a, native, a dance that's, that's popular in that country. And the dancer will be wearing a certain style of clothing. And the assignment will be, Decorate your robot to look like this dancer and program your robot to dance the dance from the country you've been assigned. And you'll see the kids trying it out. You'll see them 
playing the video and really figuring out the steps and how do they program it. And, and they'll be talking about how to represent the costume. And then at the end, you'll hear that um, one group at a time will present what they did and the other kids will clap. And it's a really, um, I'm going to say it's a very fulfilling feeling that you see kids that have put their arms all the way around a problem. They've collaborated with each other to come up with a solution, and they've presented their solution to their peers in a way that's dramatic and understandable by their peers. So that, that that's, should give at least a little picture of what it's like. That is really so Mitch, cool. Uh, if, if my school does not have a Kibo, and uh, I want to get that experience for my child. Uh, are there people just buying them for their kids and working with them, or, or is this really just through the schools? No, no. As I mentioned, about one-third of all Kibos are sold to parents or grandparents. Um, and we have, we have, you know, we have parents that will buy, uh, say, a, a lower-end version of the kit, and then uh, for a birthday or for a holiday, they'll get an add-on. So the, the child gets a kind of an expanding sense of, of their platform, and they explore that for the next six months. So, yeah, we have a website, um, kindlelabrobotics.com, where you can buy the robots. And um, this, is, this, is not, this is not the future. As you said, this is, the future has already begun. So, Mitch, I know that I've got young kids in school, and we see an awful lot of different kinds of programs being put in place to get kids interested in technology and they've got iPads in the classroom, they've got Chromebooks and we're doing 3D printing and there's a lot of different approaches to how we get kids interested in technology. How is Kibo different from a lot of these other programs? How, what would you say really sets it apart? Well, that's a really great question. I would say most schools that do have a program of introducing STEAM introduce it in late elementary school or in middle school. And there are some great robot kits and other kinds of platforms for learning STEAM at that age, um, a lot of them with you know, well-known brands. What sets Kibo apart is it's really the leading platform that's designed from day one for the youngest kids because it, it lets them explore using the cognitive skills that they currently have at their stage of development. The second thing that sets it apart is it's wildly open-ended. A kid can make their robot into whatever they want. A teacher can adapt that robot to whatever curriculum they're doing. Most robot kits are kind of programmatic in the sense that you're working to a recipe. Hmm. In Kibo, you can work to a recipe, but you don't have to. You can set out on your own and explore. The third thing is that Kibo is truly unique in the sense that it incorporates arts and crafts, which is what four to eight-year-olds really are naturally gravitating to anyway. So if you really want to speak to four to eight-year-olds at their level, speaking in the language of arts and crafts is really valuable. It gets their attention. It gets, it gets more kids excited and involved. Most robot kits are really not designed for that. So I'd say those are the, those are the and I guess the, third, the last thing is the one we've already talked about, which is the most abstract idea in technology right now is is, is the idea of code. And mm. code is something that exists on screens, and it's truly abstract. It's a kind of language, a kind of literacy. What, what Marina really thought of that I thought was truly brilliant was how to make that abstract idea of code something physically tangible and visible and understandable to a young kid by simply making it physical, making it a wooden block, which I can tell you, we're in 54 countries around the world for a reason. You could be, you could be in a, a country without having steady power supply, and you can use Kibo because it, has, it has, uh, has wooden blocks that kids in every culture understand what to do and um, doesn't require to be plugged in, doesn't require an Internet, doesn't require an iPad, doesn't require a, a, a laptop or a smartphone. So I'd say those are some of the things that make Kibo a different approach. I guess there's a meta idea that makes Kibo a little different too. Um, Marina didn't set out to make a company, and she didn't set out to make a product. She set out to understand how kids learn STEM. And she was working really purely from a research point of view about what makes sense with real kids really trying to learn. I would say that Kibo is unique in that it is probably the only product on the market today that is based exclusively on 
peer-reviewed academic research. And that makes a real difference in the efficacy of the product. That's a big difference from what you described earlier where we get attached to a particular technology and we go to market with it, right? A, a very different Yeah, story. exactly. Yeah. That's exactly right. That is precisely, that is precisely right. In, in technology space, we had that, that dynamic I described earlier. In education space, there's an analogous thing where it's better to really understand the problem before you pretend to solve it. Right. So, Mitch, at Kinder Lab Robotics, uh, you keep talking about STEAM, and most people understand STEM in education. What's the difference? Well, let's start for the folks who may not even know what STEM is. STEM is an acronym for science, technology, engineering, and math. And STEAM is perhaps the, if you will, next generation technology, or sorry, the, the corrective idea which is the same, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And by adding the arts, it really makes it more age appropriate for young kids. Um, the truth is that even as a professional engineer, I have to say, um, most often we were presented with problems that were multidisciplinary in nature, not purely technical in nature. By having arts in the STEM acronym, it really represents an analogy with the real world, where most real things that need to be designed are not only in the area of building or only in the area of programming. They also include some kind of design element. And the idea of cross-pollinating these kinds of thinking, I think, is really valuable, and there's no reason at all not to start from day one. All right. Well, what's going to happen next with Kinder Labs? Uh, are you going to be doing new versions of Kibo? Or are you going to have uh, new, new robots? Uh, you, you mentioned blocks that, that manage subroutines. What, what, what do you see coming down the road? Well, we really are finding that the Kibo platform is a fantastic um, starting point, a foundation, if you will. And we're not being so quick to come up with other platforms um, in addition to Kibo. We're more likely to focus on making the Kibo platform more broadly uh, effective for teaching a wider variety of subject matter in this, the same sort of fun and experiential way. So as you mentioned, subroutines are an idea that, boy, pretty techy, pretty understandable by computer scientists, but mm -hmm. not by folks who are not computer scientists. And there is no reason at all why the kind of thinking that goes into subroutines isn't completely understandable to kids and why they wouldn't love it. And we're working now on how to represent that so that four-year-olds can do it. Um, we're also working in the more physical, the build side of the, of the Kibo experience. So we're working on some uh, experimental elements that will help kids understand how objects in the world that they inhabit have been designed. So we're working on um, some parts that will help them answer the question, why, why do cars have wheels that are one size? And trucks have wheels that are a different size. Mm. There must be a reason. So we're working on some of the, the mechanical side of the Kibo experience as well. In general, we're trying to increase the richness of the technology built based on the same, the same foundation. And it's not just the product itself that we're changing. We're working really hard on having a wide variety of curriculum experiences so that it can be very easily adapted to all different classroom environments. And then finally, we really want to have the Kibo experience dovetail nicely with next level uh, platforms for kids as they get older. So we're going to be working on, on how to do that. And that, like um, most of our work, will involve both product improvements and curriculum improvements in order to, to give kids essentially a seamless STEAM experience from pre-K all the way up into high school. Well, Mitch, that sounds great. And we look forward to hearing from you as things develop. I think what you're doing is uh, fantastic for our education system and, and for all the kids out there. So, Mitch, I want to thank you for being with us today. Well, I have to say it was a pleasure talking with, with both of you. And thanks again for inviting me onto the show. Well, it was our pleasure, Mitch, and uh, that is going to have to do it for this edition of Fast Forward on the World Transform. My thanks 
to Ron Powell, and thanks once again to our special guest, Mitch Rosenberg, for being with us today. And thank you all for listening. We hope you will join us again as we continue to explore a future that is unfolding before us in unexpected ways and at a breathtaking pace. And until next time, live to see it. To learn more about Kibo, K-I-B-O, go to kinderlabrobotics.com. To learn more about this program, visit worldtransform.com. Thanks for listening.